Which actually brings us to our first guest. Uh, we are pleased to be joined by Annie Weinberg, who's the Associate Director of Progressive Congress, and Cole Strangler, a reporter at the, In These Times. They're going to be talking about the 84 votes. Annie, 84 votes. What was that? Hi, Emma. Hi, Annie. Very glad to be here. Um, so we did get 84 votes for the back-to-work budget, which is actually... Uh, the largest number of votes that we've seen on the record for uh, the Progressive Caucus proposed budget since uh, 2006. So we are excited to see folks going on the record for this bold set of progressive economic priorities. Um, obviously, we want there to be to be more, but it is exciting to see folks standing up for a really serious budget that actually focuses on putting America back to work and reinvesting in infrastructure instead of just endless austerity and giveaways to the well, let's talk about that, because I actually believe that budgets represent your set of priorities, but also your vision for the future. And to the extent that the Progressive Caucus's back-to-work budget was a vision about literally putting Americans back to work and, uh, you know, investing in all of the things that we've seen crumbling over time, including our infrastructure. I mean, what does it say that only 84 members of the House, but of the Democratic Caucus... Uh, only, and I know that you said that it's the highest number, uh, but to the extent that it represents our vision for the future, what, what kind of work is left for the Progressive Caucus to do to boost up those numbers in, fut- in the future? Um, I think that's a great question. I think uh, we definitely need to see more of our own Democratic Caucus uh, going on the record uh, saying, you know, this budget creates 7 million new jobs in the first year alone. This budget uh, reinvest in our school teachers and our firefighters in our crumbling roads and bridges. That's the, the stuff that we should be fighting for. And the conventional wisdom that uh, endless austerity is just good politics, that that's the only serious proposal out there, that conventional wisdom is shifting. And we need all members of the Democratic Caucus to go on record and to, to understand that, that Americans don't want these cuts to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid benefits, um, they want us to actually reinvest in, in jobs. Um, so I agree with you. I think we got to get more folks on the record uh, standing up for these things and fighting for it. Cole, you have written a series of very compelling articles in, in these times uh, about uh, the challenges and the opportunities of, or the, the challenges and the progress of the Progressive Caucus, if you will. Um, sure. there are a, there's a lot of politics here, uh, and we're in an, an era in American uh, politics where being liberal, being leftist, being, you know, on the progressive side, uh, being for Americans, being for work, being for anti-austerity measures, being for Social Security and Medicare, is actually considered a fringe position. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, well, first off, thanks so much for, for having me on. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of this weird thing where, you know, in Congress, the people that are defending these kinds of uh, issues that you're talking about are considered on the fringe, but if you look at, you know, polls in Change CPI, 70% of the country, as opposed to any sort of cut in Social Security. Um, and so the Progressive Caucus is basically, um, if you look at the positions that they take, um, whether it's a budget or any number of the other kinds of legislation they have, that ending the war in Afghanistan, you know, raising, um, putting a financial transaction tax on the table. I mean, they have the support of the majority of the American public, but of course, uh, in Congress, uh, you know, that's, it's, that's not necessarily the case. And in, in one of the articles that you wrote, you actually mentioned the, the, uh, the public option debacle, how the Progressive Caucus could have exercised its power uh, during the uh, debate around the Affordable Care Act, and yet uh, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act passed without a public option, and ultimately it actually failed because of uh, the, the, the Progressive Caucus. And, and you conclude that they're not yet serious. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, being strategic. Um, what is the right. state of that? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I've, you know, I mean, it's true. I mean, I spoke to, you know, someone on the Hill who said that, that that experience really damaged their credibility. And so looking ahead to this fight over chain CPI, where you have the White House on board with this, you have... Um, Nancy Pelosi was on board with it a couple of days ago, so she's in favor of it. Um, you know, it, it's unclear how, um, you know, how serious the stand is going to be taken. There's actually, you can kind of even see the divisions within the caucus, among caucus members on this issue, is that you have one letter that's being circulated, um, I think it was uh, Jan Tchaikovsky, who started circulating along with Ellison and Grijalva. You have over 100 members of the Democratic caucus on board uh, saying that they're opposed 
to any cuts in Social Security. There's another letter which takes a firmer, a stronger line in the sand that has uh, only 30 members of, of Congress on board that says that they will vote against um, any bill that includes those cuts. Um, so I think that kind of shows the, the divisions within the caucus even on this issue. So, Ernie, uh, being opposed versus voting against, I mean, are we parsing the line that close nowadays? It's what we have to do. It's what we have to do. We have to be against these bad ideas. Annie, uh, why do you think the Progressive Caucus can't seem to come together on uh, actually being a voting bloc uh, that will stand up against any, uh, any measures, legislative measures, to cut Social Security and Medicare? Uh, that is a great question. I think we, uh, as a movement, need to continue doing even more to show these numbers that they need to go on record saying they're going to vote against uh, these proposals that are damaging to the economy, to the American people, to their base, to the people that endorse for them and support them, uh, that they are uh, supported when they take a strong, firm stance in voting against and committing to, to vote against these, uh, these terrible measures. Um, so we've seen an outpouring of grassroots support uh, around this budget. There were 46 different organizations that separately endorsed the budget, over 100,000 um, uh, community co-sponsors that, that voiced their support. Uh, and that kind of thing does actually make an impact. It uh, shows members of Congress that their uh, courage on this and a bold stance on this is what moment called for. So we have to do more of that uh, all the time. Well, speaking of courage, I mean, I actually have been uh, bowled over by the courage of Keith Ellison uh, and Raul Grijalva, uh that, you know, Keith Ellison, I think in this budget round, they realized <clears throat> that they had to win a communications and media war. Uh, and so they did everything that they could to be heard through the mainstream media. Cole, you mentioned that uh, this is a tactical issue, uh, perennial tactical issue with the Progressive Caucus. Do you see uh, any light at the end of this tunnel? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's obviously hard to predict, but I think that it is. It's definitely fair to say that um, the budget has been, and uh, you know, even historically, back when the Congress was getting organized, the budget was a way of getting it on the map. Um, so now, I mean, when people hear about the Progressive Caucus, it's because of uh, the budget they put out for the last three years. Um, and this year, more than any other year, actually, the back-to-work budget, um, not because they've watered it down for any reason, but it was getting more attention, and you saw kind of that more of that visibility. So that's sort of one, that's one way of, of getting the message out there. Um, but, you know, ultimately, the, in, you know, it's going to take some sort of uh, better cohesive, uh, coherent relationship between members of Congress and then the grassroots. Um, I think there's this idea out there that the right, the Tea Party, you know, is much more accountable to the grassroots. I don't know if that's the case because you can't really talk about the grassroots and talk about the Tea Party. It's funded so much by by corporate interests, so we can't, you know, the left can't model it itself on that model. Um, but um, you know, there needs to be some more accountability to the base, and that's going to require just a, a better relationship, um, you know, between between the caucus and its allies. Um, and that's something that you know. It's hard to predict, but uh, I guess we'll see. And I think a major test of this um, is going to be how the caucus is able to use its leverage on this vote, um, you know, as part of the so-called grand bargain, this vote on potential cuts to Social Security. This is its chance, basically, to show that, um, you know, it, it should be taken seriously and that it actually stands for the values that it, that it says it does. So when you talk about a base, and, you know, every politician is thinking about their next election, we're walking into, we're walking into um, um, the Easter recess and then a longer recess in a couple of weeks. And the older voter will be very important, particularly when it's a lower turnout election right. in 2014. I guess where I'm going with this is if we have 3 million members of the National Committee, what would be, what do you think their core message should be when they go to town halls, when they go to meet with their House members, uh, both on the Democratic and Republican side? What is their core message given this fight? Sorry, could you just repeat that question again? I missed that, about who's, who's core message? I just missed the so we have seen the senior vote in the next election is very important, and, of course, right. we are with right. the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. We have 3 million members. Given all of this, what should be their core message as they talk to uh, their House members during town halls, when they meet with them as constituents, et cetera, et cetera? Right. I mean, I think, I think the core message should be that, you know, there should be absolutely no cuts at all to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Um, I mean, and again, as, as you know, as, as you were talking about before, this is not a fringe position by any means. You look at polls, and 70% of 
American people are on board with this. Um, it just so happens that because of Congress and the nature of the political system, you have, you know, that this is, this is somehow seen as a, a kind of uncompromising radical position to be holding in Congress today, that you're opposed to any benefit cuts whatsoever. But if you look at what people actually believe, it's a very, it's a very mainstream position. So it's not so much that, you know, I mean, it, it reflects the fact that Congress is disconnected from the American people. But I think that, um, you know, the message should just be hold the line as firmly as possible. And, um, you know, there, there, is a, there is a precedent for fighting off attacks of Social Security like this. Um, as I pointed out in the, the feature I did for In These Times back in 2005, uh, when President Bush, who, you know, had a majority, Republican majority in the House and Senate, coming off his reelection, kind of emboldened, wanted to privatize Social Security. Um, and it seemed like it was a possibility, but there was such a tremendous backlash against that that, you know, even the Republicans in Congress knew that this was not a politically appropriate proposal and they had to withdraw. So I think if you have that kind of just um, really bold grassroots opposition, then you can kind of stop these cuts from happening. I think that should be the, the strategy if I had to kind of give my, my own take on that. Yeah, and Annie, uh, we mentioned uh, earlier, Cole mentioned this whole notion of uh, towing the party line. And, and what we really have here is a situation where the Democrats themselves are divided, where you have nominally progressive leaders, leaders who have had uh, progressive uh, credentials in the past, like Nancy Pelosi, actually siding with uh, the President of the United States of America in favor of cutting benefits, uh, Social Security benefits for seniors, for vets, et cetera. I mean, anybody who gets a benefit that's issued by the government would be affected by the chain CPI. What happened to Nancy Pelosi? And the second part of my question is, is what do progressives have to do to disassociate themselves with their leadership? Uh, well, I will take the opportunity to quote something that Keith Ellison said recently, which he said, I am a supporter of the president, but that doesn't mean I'm a servant of the president, and I don't support him on this. I mean, the, these lines have to be clear, and we have to be unrelenting in not just our state of the opposition, but actually committing to, to vote against any of these benefit cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, they're just rolling back the fundamental progressive programs that built the middle class in this country you know, in, in the 20th century, um, and it's a slippery slope. Uh, the chain CPI idea is a benefit cut. It's going to hurt senior citizens and uh, senior women in particular uh, very deeply, and uh, we have to staunchly oppose these both, you know, in terms of calling on our progressive elected leaders to do it, um, and as a movement saying this is a line in the sand. This is not, uh, uh, this is not a compromisable thing. Um, it's a core fight. But, Cole, we know that Democrats traditionally toe the party line, more or less. Uh, and I think that progressives, perhaps, uh, you know, more so than others, certainly than the blue dogs that used to uh, regularly cross party lines in order to vote with Republicans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Cole, uh, what does the progressive caucus have to do in order to, and I, I do love that line uh, by Keith Ellison. I think that he is one of the champions out here who is able to walk that line and understand how to take a stand when it counts. Uh, but how do you actually bring the rest of the caucus along? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't comment on how, you know, the specifics of trying to organize votes ahead of, you know, organizing specifics around getting people to, to vote in a certain way. But I think what it comes down to is basically on sites like this, voting more cohesively as a block. Um, and, you know, that's something that they haven't done not necessarily that successfully in the past. But I think it comes down to basically, um, you know, trying to get, you know, members on board to, to hold the line and to, to make specific stands on, on these kinds of issues. Um, so, I mean, that, that's, that's to me, I, mean, I think that's the most, you know, clear way you can show that, um, you know, that the caucus is, is unified and actually stands for something is by, you know, having a record of, of voting consistently. So I, that's what it's going to come down to, I think. Yeah. Ernie, and t I was involved in the wars, the privatization wars of 2005, and literally I was all across the country talking to, I mean, seniors, to young people, to college students, you name it, uh, about Social Security. There was a true unified movement. I think that what we're seeing here now, uh, because we actually have a Democratic presidency uh, and uh, the Democrats control the Senate, I think that progressives and, and Democrats in general are like deer in a headlight. They seem to be unable uh, to figure out how to actually move the political sphere and organize in a way uh, that will beat back uh, this threat. Um, and, and it's because of the party complication 
the issue of partisanship in, 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 in Washington. Uh, do you have any ideas? Well, I think it has to be seat by seat. You know, I was with, um, with Max a few weeks ago, Max Richmond, our CEO and president at the National Committee, and he was we were sort of thinking out loud about how to fight this thing. And one thing he said to me, and it just hit me like a, uh, it hit me hard. He said, can you imagine being a House member or being a senator and standing up in front of 200 seniors saying, and answering the question about whether or not their COLA got cut based on a vote that that member took? There's, a, there's an emotional feeling about the cost of living adjustment. I, I've, I've been in the senior movement for a number of years. I've taken hundreds of phone calls about why didn't I get my COLA this year? Why right. didn't I get my one, two, three percent? Mm -hmm. Yet my my Medicare premiums went up. Yeah. You get those kind of questions, and it's it's deeply rooted, and people have earned it, and they deserve it. And the point being that I think it's a slippery slope politically. I think that the Democrats could lose the Senate over this. Mm -hmm. I think there's some seats. Any Democrat that won in 2012 with 53 percent or more. Mm -hmm. Could lose their seat in 2014 because if this if this fires up as an issue and I think it can and we have to fire it up as an issue in order to get people to stand in front of their congressional members and their US senators and say don't do this Social Security hasn't got a thing to do with a deficit you know mm -hmm. there's there's other things you could do do not cut what I what I need to stay out of poverty All right so it's my I guess the best way to answer that my and it's a good question is House seat by House seat, Senate seat by Senate seat, constituents being organized and firm and knowing the issues and being very, very strong on saying, do not do this. Annie and Cole, thank you so much for being on the show today. Can we have you on in the future? Of course. Yeah, Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You are listening to Pivot Point with Maya Rockymore, sponsored by the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. We'll be right back after the break. Thank you. 